Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of I Never Knew But My Dog Did podcast. I'm so happy to have all of you here and continuing to leave your five-star reviews and your comments for me. As always, and I'm just going to keep saying it, my guest today oh, is absolutely wonderful. And he's scheduled within one day, which is really cool. So he is like on it and we we have to talk it. There's an urgency that we need to talk. So my next guest, and first of all, I love his name, um, is <laughs> Troy Love. And Troy Love is the self-love guru with a knack for spiritual growth and a master's degree in social work from the University of Pittsburgh, which he swears he got after surviving countless all-nighters and a lot of pierogies. Ooh, that sounds fun. <laughs> Currently, he is serving as a clinical director of Yuma Counseling Services in Yuma, Arizona, which he affectionately calls the land of sand and scorching heat and literally where Han Solo was thrown into the Sarlacc. And I can appreciate that. As you all know, I'm an Arizona native and just moved here to Texas. Good old Texas, y'all. All y'all know. Uh, only two months ago. So I can appreciate the land of sand. Troy is dedicated to helping people achieve greater peace, joy, and love in their lives while also surviving the occasional sandstorm. He's the founder of Finding Peace Consulting, which is affiliated with actual treasure hunting, finding the treasure within. He is a psychotherapist, educator, consultant, and keynote speaker. He's a two-time Amazon bestselling author. He's practically a literary rock star, except with more self-help and fewer groupies. Oh my God, I love you. And a TEDx speaker, my hero. That's my next goal. Uh, he can talk about self-compassion and living in truth for hours. Just ask his kids with me, I never knew. Welcome. Hi, Mr. Troy. Hello. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Your humor. I, it's like my humor. So I, I love you. We throw in those little, those little quips. Um, no, I love everything that you do. I feel like we're so like-minded because we both value the psychology aspect, but yet I, as well as you being a life coach here, I, I value the life experience that I've had and the spiritual side of it, then things that you cannot learn in a book. So yeah. here at I Never Knew, we start with our knee story. And that is, what was the moment in your life that you were like on your knees and you were just thinking, whatever is going on in my life, this is bad. This is not working for me. And something has to change. Do you have a knee story? I do, actually. Um, there's a lot of knee stories, but the one that, that really rises up for us, for me is my former spouse and I, when we were married, um, for the first 10 years of our life, we could not have children. And we did all the different infertility testing and medications and all those things. And it just didn't work. And the doctor said, really, our only, our last chance is to do in vitro. And if that doesn't work, then, then you're going to have to either go without children or, or adopt or something. And initially I didn't want to, uh, our chances of having children through in vitro was about 30%, 33%. And I was like, this is going to cost a lot of money that we don't have. It's going to be a lot of debt and our chances aren't great. But something compelled me to say yes. Um, I feel like my higher power compelled me to say yes. And so we began the process uh, for probably 15 years prior to that, I had been addicted to porn. It was also one of the major problems in our, our marriage right from the get go. I had kept that a secret from my spouse because I thought that it would go away when we got married and, and then it didn't. Um, and so I battled that uh, really badly. So I'm in the doctor's office. My wife is in the other room getting prepped to 
uh, have her her eggs taken out and they need to be fertilized by me. And so they put me in this room and this room had porn everywhere. There was porn on the walls, there was magazines, there was a TV that was on um, to help aid in the process, I guess. And I kneeled down and I said, Heavenly Father, this is not how I want to bring a child into the world. I had I had made billions of promises before to God, like, hey, if you if if you do this for me, I promise I'll stop. If you do this for me, I promise I'll stop. If you do this for me, I promise I'll stop. But this was a different prayer. It was I do not want to bring a child into the world like this. I don't want to have children who have to deal with a father who is addicted to porn. So will you please help me not do this anymore? Will you please help me not bring this into their world? And if by chance, miracle of miracles, we have a baby, I will dedicate my life to recovery and really do my best to not go back. And then I turned all the magazines over and turned the TV off and I produced the sample. And 10 months later, we had a baby girl and uh, I was able to be in recovery from that point on. That was a life changing moment for me and one that I'm incredibly grateful for. Oh. That just melts my heart. I had a guest named Joshua Shea on who is a porn addiction recovery coach. And he talked about porn addiction. And I think it's good that we do talk about it. And I think it's important because it's not talked about when our children, and I'm raising a 15 year old grandson right now. And it's not talked about enough that that's not normal, but it was normalized. Um, I know in my generation and you and I are about the same age. Right. Um, and I love that that you say, you know, I don't want to bring this into my children's eyes. I don't want to be doing this. And it's not that they would have any idea, but it's just you knowing it felt wrong for you. Right. Um, and it was answered and you met that promise. I what a beautiful, beautiful story. And where there where there is definitely a mindset, there's definitely a way. And when there's a higher power or something that you believe. Um, will happen. It can happen. You create this reality. And what a great story. Oh my gosh. My heart is just like pounding. That Thank is you. amazing. Now you did say just as his kids. So I'm <laughs> guessing we had more. We did. Uh, two years later, a boy came all by himself out of the <laughs> world without any extra help. And then uh, we had four embryos left and none of them were successful so we are blessed with two kids i love that i love that and i feel like i feel like when little souls want to come they're going to come in whatever way possible um after my first two children who were very close in age two days and two years and one day apart my girls um and then i think it was six years um, but I had endometriosis and I was told I couldn't have any more kids. I had scar tissue surgeries and all that. And I was like, Oh, well, I'm happy. I love my girls. Um, and then my son came along just <laughs> out of the blue. And let me tell you, the timing wasn't great. We were headed for a divorce, but he said, I don't really care what's going on with you. I'm supposed to be here. So <laughs> that story reminds me of, you know, when they're supposed to be here, they're That's supposed right. to be here. So your business is called Finding Peace Consulting, which I love. What is what is the the main ideas that you give in your courses, in your consulting, and in your workbooks that really help someone who's stuck? And most of us in, in the coaching climate and therapy climate know people come and they just don't see any hope out of where they are. What are some of the first things that you tell them? What are the steps to take? Well, we are wired for connection, neurologically, spiritually, biologically, socially, sexually, we are wired to be connected to one another. And if something happens that damages those connections or severs them or breaks them, that can 
create a tremendous amount of pain. And it can also create what I call attachment wounds. So there's six attachment wounds, loss, neglect, rejection, abandonment, betrayal, and abuse. And oftentimes these wounds were created when we were growing up. It, uh, sometimes our parents, sometimes neighbors, sometimes other people in our lives created them and they become trapped in our body. Trauma is trapped in our body. And then as we continue to go through life, things will bump up against these wounds. So I tell people they're like a sunburn. If you've ever had a sunburn, you become really careful. You don't want anybody to bump up against you. You don't want anybody to get near you when that, when that sunburn's really hot. So you be, you start to put up barriers and you start to put up, um, things to prevent people from getting close, which creates quite the dilemma because we are wired for connection. So if I, I want you to come close, I need you to come close, but I become really afraid that you're going to hurt me. So that's the first principle. And the second, it's not actually the wound that causes us suffering, though. It's what we've come to believe about ourselves as a result. So my top wounds are abandonment, rejection, and abuse. And I was growing up, and what I tended to believe about myself was that I wasn't enough. There was something wrong with me. I was flawed. I was defective. No one's actually going to show up for me. I can't trust anybody. And that became really the paradigm of which I viewed the world. And it caused a lot of suffering. So on one hand, I'm craving connection. And yet my, my core beliefs and my shame told me that I'm not worthy of love. And so I would push people away. And uh, it took me a while to figure that out. And when I started to uh, do some of my own work, when I started to go to therapy and put some pieces together, I created a model called the Finding Peace model. And that's really the core of it, which is if I can do wound care, if I can start to tend to these wounds through self-compassion in other ways, and I can challenge those negative core beliefs that I've been carrying around with me and rewrite them, then I create a different paradigm, a different world in which I can actually create, I can actually connect with people and not go into that. Even when my rejection wound is hit, I don't immediately go into, well, I'm bad and I'm flawed and I'm defective. It's like, hmm, that hurt and I'm enough and I can work through this and, and I still can do things. And so the paradigm shifts and then the wound starts to heal. Yeah. Yeah. And that it takes practice like anything else. It's that repetitiveness of the self thought, the self talk. Um, I, I really love that. One of the things in my coaching, when I, when I have, you know, just the, the first steps for what I think are important with my clients is the recognition part, because, you know, we can't just jump right into change. We can't jump into action. Like let's recognize what we're doing. Do you think that's like, before you take those steps and changing that paradigm, what are some of the small little steps that get us to that big change of changing the paradigm? So um, I have uh, in the workbook that I wrote for the Finding Peace workbook, there is a wound assessment and it can actually be pretty triggering for people when they take it. But when they take it, they start to actually see the wounds that they have. There are so many people that say, I don't have any wounds. I was fine. I said that when I was in my 20s too. And then when I started to sit with it and realize, oh, I do. And I could give it a name. That was huge. It wasn't about blame. It wasn't about victimness. It was, I gave it a name and now I can talk about it. So I can identify that I have a rejection wound. I can talk about it. What does that mean for me? What does it mean? How do I show up and treat other people differently? And so that was the first step is having vocabulary to be able to talk about what I had been dealing with for a really long time, but didn't know how to say it. And so that's a first step is really just identifying what, what wound do I have? and What do I believe about myself when it's hit? I love that so much. And listeners, do you notice it wasn't a blame game? It wasn't I'm in pain and I have these wounds and I have this trauma because they did this to me. So-and-so did this to me. Part of the journey of healing that I found was 
being able to do that self-awareness and do that self-evaluation without placing that blame on on the people who did it which is hard because you know there's stuck anger which is hurt turned inside out um what i've learned how it works really well for me now is being able to when i'm in in the presence of someone or dealing with someone who i feel is not healthy for me i now know how to sort of deep dive or even come up with an idea of they must have a lot of insecurities or they must have a lot of pain where they have to treat people that way. And it's the only way they know how to do it. So it really helped. And that's not blame. I changed it from doing blame to more compassion and understanding for mm-hmm. others. Did you find the same thing that as you healed, you became, you know, less defensive and less blaming and more self-aware and actualized than you were? Absolutely. I used to be really judgmental, yeah. really judgmental. Blame really is our way of trying to get rid of pain and discomfort. We want to just give it to somebody else and have them deal with it. Oftentimes the people we want to give it to don't have the capacity to do a whole lot with it or they would have changed a long time ago. So yeah. it's not very effective. And so then I'm just carrying a lot of resentment. So as I started to realize, you know, I have wounds and so do they help me be more compassionate it really diminished my judgment of them and judgment of myself too definitely i mean we're talking displacement and projection is you know someone did something to me and you're gonna pay for it or projection is um i want you to feel what i feel or i'm i'm assuming you're doing something and assuming is probably the most toxic trait that we have as as humans is you just it's one of those cognitive distortions that, you know, that just, they don't work. We all know. No, but they feel really good, but they're they, not effective. <laughs> yes, yes. And we've now expanded the cognitive distortions from, I think when I first studied, it was eight. Now we're up to like 15. And I think we're going to just, by the time I pass away, we're going to have like a hundred. So what we say there is you're just a human living a human experience. And, and the way that we think just gets more complex or it gets easier, right? It does. Um, I actually met Mr. Rogers right before I, I know it's beautiful, right before we moved to to Yuma. He he lived in Pittsburgh and I was at a concert, Christmas concert. And during the intermission, I was looking at, we were in this old church. I was like looking at the architecture and all the things. Then I look behind me and there he is. And I'm like, hey, hey, there's Mr. Rogers. And I, I said, well, oh, you shouldn't bother him. Like he's here in public. And this guy sitting next to me is like, this is your only chance, buddy. You're never going to have this chance again. So we walk over there and he stood up and he talked to us for about 15 minutes. The thing that he said to me that was profound and I still remember to this day is life is simple and deep, oh. but the world makes us shallow and complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've really thought about how much I complicate my life and with things that don't really matter. And really, the solutions to most of our problems are pretty simple, but they're deep. They take effort and they take heart. And if we, but if we can simplify it, it really does make things better for us and others. Truly, I think that's a really great way of putting it and... Um, I, I base a lot of my, my beliefs and my teachings around dogs because dogs are more simple. They really don't overthink anything. <laughs> and, and that's why they live in a, a joyful life. That's why they I, love unconditionally because they don't put any conditions on the love they have for us. Oh, you were gone at work all day. Well, when you come home, I'm going to be mad and I'm going to hold a grudge and I'm not going to talk to you. No, they don't overthink it. They're like, Hey, you were gone. Now you're home and I'm happy you're yeah. home if we could only live that way. And so that's basically what I wrote my books on and why everything's themed around the dogs. I heard a, my favorite Ted talk is why you'll marry the wrong person by a philosopher named Alan DeBotton. And one of the, I listened to it again, like the third or fourth time the other day. And I listened to it and I heard something I hadn't heard. And he said, relationships are a negotiation of imperfections absolutely isn't that great i i know i was like 
oh, I could never have said that so perfectly because that's what it is. Our problem that we come into is when I want you to be like me and you want me to be like you. Right. We're not, we're not negotiating our differences and our imperfections. And that's when I believe as a relationship um, expert that that's where we run into problems. Like you butt heads when I'm wanting you to be something that I am, that I'm not, or that I am, you can't do that. So is that something, what are some of the most common things you see being that you're the clinical director um, of the counseling services? What are some of the trends you're seeing most right now in your practice? I and mean, I know we have to be HIPAA compliant here, but I mean, mm -hmm. in general, um, what is the most prominent thing that you see as a problem for us mental health wise in the world today? Well, I was just talking with a client earlier today about relationships. So we all have wounds. We all do. And when we fall in love with somebody, there's this moment of anesthesia where we don't feel the pain. And then as we start to interact with this person and maybe make them a life partner, then the anesthesia wears off. And now we bump up against each other's wounds. We sleep together, we eat together, we drive in the car together, we do things. And so I'm going to bump up against your wounds and you're going to bump up against mine. And I may not have a whole lot of compassion for that. So we typically will end up engaging in one of four behaviors to deal with that. And I call them the burpees. The exercise burpees is my least favorite exercise of all time. And it, so the acronym comes from that. But blame, rescuing, protesting or escaping. And so I see that in, in the business world. I see that as parents. I see that uh, in our romantic relationships. I see that with our friends. We can get into blaming. We can protest and complain. And really, it's a victim-y kind of energy of like, this isn't fair. Why is this happening? But there's nothing I can do about it. We can just try to tell everybody else how to fix it. But we don't really jump into listening or, or helping them come up with a solution. We just think our way is the best way and, and you should do it my way. And if you don't, you're dumb. Or we just check out, we escape. And I see that in politics. I see that in the way that our education system is running. I see that in all the ways. We're all hurting and we're all using really maladaptive behaviors to try and cope with it rather than really listening, problem solving, checking in with each other, it's coming with win-win negotiations, acceptance, those kind of things. I, I love that so much. And, and as you said, those different methods, and sorry, I got the puppies in the background. Sorry, not sorry, because I love my puppies. They're usually very quiet, but daddy just drove up. So, uh, but I love those. I, I love all of those because I, as you said them, I went, I've done them all. I've done every one of those at some point in my life. And I would say prominently I'm the rescuer. I mean, I'm, I'm a service creature. What can I say? It's what I came here on this earth to do. But during your different phases of life, you've done each of these things. And I think when we, we have addictions, that's when we're escaping and the rescuing is codependence. I mean, we could put a name to all of this. Absolutely. Stuff. Blaming. We could go with narcissistic gaslighting. You know, it's like, <laughs> genius you're a genius so that that's a really neat way of of breaking it down like what are you doing um I, I think that's fantastic so tell me um let's see I love the the wired um for connection because I believe the same thing we're we're not made to be hermits in a cave and the biggest problem in our existence is connection and the biggest joy in our existence is connection and our problem is just trying to find a balance there right right so oh i love it so i i i saw on your um questionnaire and i and i love that we you mentioned the attachment wounds now that's a really pertinent thing that comes from parental figures primarily right what are the different types of attachment wounds? And I know we talked earlier about mm -hmm. um, the neglect. I can go over them. Does it specifically have to be um, parents? No. Okay. 
Okay. So let's go back over those. Cause I really, I really enjoyed those different categories of, sure. of the attachment ones. So look, tell us about that. So loss is, they're not in any particular order, but loss is a wound that often happens when we have a loved one who passes away. Uh, somebody develops Alzheimer's. If you grew up in a military family and you had to move every three years. And so you always had to say goodbye to your friends. Mm. So it's a wound that happens not because anybody did anything to you. It's a part of the world that we have, the life that we live in. Um, I get, you know, got a diagnosis of cancer or I have type two diabetes. That's a form of loss where uh, part of my body doesn't work the way it used to. So it's a, a sense that there was somebody there or somebody, something there, and now it's gone, but it's not because anybody did it on purpose. Oh, so, okay. um, and so some loss can be really, really profound. I have two employees right now who've both suddenly lost their spouses and that sudden loss is heartbreaking. And so the, the grieving process that they're going through and the wounds that come up from that, just because that's part of life. The second wound is neglect. And there's like the child protective services version of that where mom and dad are gone for days and the kids have no food in the in the house and there's a two-year-old running around with a poopy diaper. But there's also the more common version of neglect where mom and dad are very busy on their phone, they're very busy with work, they're they're checking out with their friends, and so the the child needs emotional attention and mom and dad are too busy so the child really comes to believe that i'm not worth your time i'm i don't matter to you so that neglect wound really the message is i'm not i'm not important so you can see that even when you're going to dinner and all all the family members are on their phones instead of talking to each other so uh so that can be a wound that can happen where when i really needed someone my caregiver, uh, my teacher or something, and they just never gave me time. Yeah. It's the message that I'm not important. Yeah. The next Di disengagement, basically saying that I don't matter and what's important to me doesn't matter. And that's something I've worked on with my grandson. I've now, um, I have custody of for the last couple of years, who's 15. He had that where people just mm -hmm. weren't engaged and at first it was a big shift because we were like, well, how was your day? And he, I remember the first time I, I, when he, I walked into his room and I said, um, is there anything you want to talk about? And he froze and he goes, what, what do you, what do you mean? And I go, I don't know. I go, I just, I want to know if there's anything you want to talk about. And he literally said to me at 14 years old, nobody's ever asked me that. Mm. And it just broke my heart. It's like, that's wow. exactly what it was. I think it was that emotional neglect because everything else was met, but mm -hmm. you just don't feel like you're just, you're existing and you don't feel like people care. And that's that connection piece. Like you said, we're wired to connect and you're disconnected from people caring about who you are. So right. wonderful, wonderful examples. What's the next one? Rejection. So that one came for me, especially when I was, being bullied in middle school, I would every day in gym and I I'm lousy at sports. I've always been, but, um, every day in gym after gym was over, I would stand in the hallway waiting for the bell to ring and the boys would circle around me and they would call me names like gay faggot femme words. I didn't understand. And they would try to beat me up. They would chase me home. It was a puny little short kid. So, what I got from that is I don't belong. So that's usually the core belief that comes with rejection. There's something wrong with me. I don't have what it takes. I don't belong here. Um, so I'm not wanted here. And so I need to get, I need to leave. So that can come from a parent who tells the kid you're stupid, you're an idiot, but it can come from peers. It, it can come from being uh, fired from a a job or not being selected for a job so that can bump up against that. So depending on how big that wound was when we're little, then when we grow up and things like, oh, I applied for this job and I didn't get it, that could be really, really hard for somebody who has a rejection wound. Whereas if somebody doesn't have a rejection wound, they're like, oh, 
I'll just try it for the next one. It's not a big deal. So that kind of helps put some sense into why some people really do take it more personally. It's probably because they have a pretty big rejection wound and deep inside, they just don't feel like they belong and that they matter. Wow. That's a really neat connection that you made there. And I call it Tony, the trigger, you know, it's you, sometimes you don't even know these things happen to you. And I've had a couple of guests lately where they're talking about the, um, um, what, what is, oh, I lost my thought process. Um, um, PTSD, oh, complex PTSD. That's what it is, which is childhood PTSD. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really realize there was a significance because everybody associates it with military or mm -hmm. abuse or trauma, but that's when I found a lot of us, especially when you get, you know, I'd say 30 and over or 35 and over, maybe even your forties and fifties, you start realizing, oh, wow, this thing happened. I, I didn't really think about it because it was our norm in our household and no one right. talked about that. Exactly. So Tony, the trigger comes out, like you said, when I wanted this job or I, you know, I wanted this client or I wanted this appearance or in, it wasn't anything personal, but it was so personal because I was right. told I would never amount to anything. So right. really good, really, really good stuff. And what's our next one? Abandonment. So um, I was adopted. Um, by the way, my last name really is Love. I was adopted into a family with the last name Love. So, so I think the universe um, had something to do with that. Yes. Um, but I was adopted. It was a closed adoption. And I was adopted at five days old. And uh, I have since met my birth mother. But she told me that when I was born, that because it was a closed adoption, they immediately took me away. So she didn't even get to hold me. She didn't get to really see me. And then they put me in the nursery for five days until my parents came to get me. And uh, for my, I knew I was adopted from the time I was a little kid. And I would always tell everybody, hey, my name's Troy, I'm adopted. Uh, and, uh, and I, but I was adopted, I was born in the hospital down the street from my house. So I knew that there was a high likelihood that I might have some siblings. And so all through school, I was always looking around. Does anybody look like me? Um, is there anybody here? And so I was always looking. It felt like I was this alien that had been plopped from outer space. And so it, even though uh, I sort of looked like the people that I was living in the house with, there was things that I didn't know and there was nobody to answer those questions. And so the the biggest question was why did my birth mother give me up? Um, what did she not want me? I wasn't wanted. Did she leave um, because she just couldn't handle me, which that wasn't the truth, but I didn't know. So there was this unknowing. And um, there was something else I was going to say about that. But um, so with, with the abandonment, it's that you have somebody in your life. Oh, I didn't really figure out that this was a wound for me until I was in therapy. And my my therapist was saying like, look, you were in this woman's womb for like nine months. You could hear her heartbeat. You could hear her voice. You could hear her breathing. You could hear her tummy gurgling. And then all of a sudden she was gone. And so there was this, this absence where somebody was there and now they're gone. It's different than lost though, because this person late leaves. And so you don't, and there's no explanation. So you don't have any closure. You don't know why they're, they've gone. And there's so many parents whose fathers or mothers have just walked out and they, the kid doesn't know why mom or dad left or um, there was some significant person in their life and then all of a sudden they just disappeared and nobody knows why they, they're gone. So that abandonment is, there's no answers. I'm left with no answers. And so then as a kid who's really inquisitive, I will come up with my own explanations and they're usually not correct, yeah. but they're usually things like, well, it must have been because I was really bad. It must have been because I just didn't, and nobody really wanted me, and that's why. And they don't understand, no, they didn't have anything to do with you. But yeah. from an egocentric perspective, that's what a kid comes to believe. Yeah, because that's all you can think of. I mean, it's that's our imaginations as children. Right. And we, we create something, whether it's true or not. Um, that's interesting. I love that you say that, because... People would think loss and abandonment are the same thing, but you're you're correct. That loss part of it is there is a reason for it, and you know there's a reason for it. it. Doesn't hurt any less, but there's a reason. And the abandonment, which is a pretty widespread 
um, attachment issue and things that a lot of people have that are deep seated that they haven't addressed, um, especially divorce. You know, mm-hmm. today in today's world, like one minute mom and dad are together and we're having a great time as a regular family. And the next thing they're in two different houses and it's still an abandonment. It's like, we're, Absolutely. You're, you're not in my immediate presence. Things are not the same as they were. And you can't, as a child, always understand adult problems and, right. you know, why that happened. Um, I just, I love it. I, I think all of it is, is super amazing. Um, you have really, really good insight into um, everything. And I love that you said when I was in therapy, see everybody, I was a life coach. I had a life coach. He's a therapist. He had a therapist. See, it's, <laughs> you know what? We all help each other. I earn charge exactly. of iron, right? I, yep. Now, interestingly enough, you do have another story that I do want to, um, if you don't mind, touch on, because we do have time. Um, you talk about as a teenager in your 20s, you experienced religious trauma. And I've actually had a guest who was raised in a cult and I'm fascinated. Um, In fact, I'm going to go to Waco soon because I'm fascinated by the whole David Koresh thing. Um, And don't get me on my soapbox about the government, what, what they did. I'm not saying David Koresh was right. I'm just saying the way we handled it was wrong, but I'm fascinated by religious trauma and brainwashing and, and those things that happen in the cults. So let me, let me in on your, your religious trauma and your experience with that. So it was slightly different. I did grow up in a pretty, and I'm still a member of that faith, but I grew up in a pretty strong religious background and there's a lot of dogma that's connected with that. Some of which I, um, not sure I connect with anymore, but, um, but there was a lot of rules around all of those things. And there was a time when I was in, so when I was, when I was in my teenage years and I stumbled upon masturbation and that's a thing you don't do. You're like, really bad. You're not supposed to. I, think I know no what other... religion you're talking about. You'll go blind. And... Yeah. I had an Irish Catholic mother and so I'm just, I, I'm right there with you. There's a lot of rules associated. So continue. So, and, and we didn't talk about it. Like there was no talking about this stuff. So I was left with coming up with erroneous conclusions that I was horrible. I was a sinner. I was going to hell. And that's when the God, I promise I'll never do it again. I promise. And then the next day. And so that, that, culture um it was really the culture of we we don't talk about that especially in my family we just didn't talk about it or we were shamed shamed about it so that was kind of the precursor of that and so i was always wanting to be the good boy wanting to show up and be the most obedient most faithful kid on one hand so that nobody would know that i had this dark secret of mine and the other was to really just prove to God that I was enough and everybody else. So then when I'm in my um, late twenties in my faith, there's opportunities to volunteer for things. And um, I was struggling with my, uh, my wife and I had been married for about 10 years by that time. And we had been struggling with a lot of things. And a, a part of my life, became known to my ecclesiastical leader. And within four hours of that being known, I was in uh, the office of another ecclesiastical leader. And I was basically told I'm not allowed to volunteer in the service that I was doing anymore. And there was, it was not done with love. It was not done with kindness. Um, It was done out of fear. And I have made, like I'm at peace with it now. When I tell people this story, they get all riled up and they're like, oh my gosh, but for me, I'm at peace with it. But at that time, that felt like an uh, ultimate rejection. Even my church doesn't want me. I really must be bad. And I felt abandoned um, by the other members. Like nobody really knew what was going on. They made a public announcement that I was no longer going to be serving in this particular um calling and that um and so but nobody came up and talked to me nobody asked how i was doing nobody checked in with me and so i went into a deep deep depression i was suicidal 
at that time I had like nine different ways. They were all stupid, but nine different ways I was going to kill myself. I was going to wander out in the desert and find a rattlesnake and see if it bite me. Like some pretty stupid ones, but I was in such a depressed state and I was curled up in a ball in, in the closet for several days. And it took me probably six years to let go of all of that anger and resentment that I had. And it was, and I was trapped because I really still wanted my kids to be um, part of the, you know, have their faith. And so I would go, but I would be so angry because I, I felt like I had to go because that's what the good boy would do, but I didn't really want to be there. And it really was um, really hard. And even to this day, my anger, the way that I dealt with that had an effect on my kids that didn't, wasn't great, but that, that really feeling like even God didn't want me, that rejection from there was profound for me. Yeah. And I think even more so, which, which is something I, I find is underlying everything, shame and humiliation. You know, Mm -hmm. we, we beat ourselves up so bad. And then when someone compounds that on top of it, it, it is even worse. Um, and, and yet that programming that you had where you got to be in this religion to be a good person and to go to the place where you're going to go when you pass. Right. Um, and I love the evolution. And like I was saying, you know, my mother was Irish Catholic, but we did not practice in my home. My father was atheist or he says he's atheist. I don't know if I truly believe that, but we, the, the thing that they, and I've said this before to people is I, I'm actually grateful that they didn't give us anything. I'd rather have Mm. nothing than have Mm -hmm. all of that inserted in me um, and have to undo that later. And so I sort of evolved into my own, you know, friends that were Christian, my grandparents that I absolutely adored, they were Lutheran and they actually were caretakers of church. And that's where I felt love. And so at that stage, I'm like, oh, it's God and Jesus. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and then I kind of evolved what, what I find interesting as a human experience is when you go through something like that and you feel so alone. And I think we all have to experience that feeling of being so isolated and cut out to rely on ourselves. I ha- I know mm-hmm. I had to do that to finally find that self-worth and self-love at the bottom, the very bottom of the barrel. And you said no one came up and talked to you or asked you about it. What did you learn from that? Did you learn self-reliance? Did you learn, what did you learn? I can't trust everybody that people maybe can be superficial. Like what was your, your take on that as far as the community that you had who let you down? Well, well, I, I mean, because I already had a, I already had an abandonment wound and I had a rejection wound. The core beliefs that I had were nobody will show up for me if I needed them anyway. So it just reinforced the negative core belief that I had, like nobody really cares. So there was this apathy that I had, this bitter apathy that I carried around with me for a while. And, you know, people would say, well, do you go up and say hello to people? And I said, well, I could, but I don't want to. Like, <laughs> I, I don't want to. And so I would own that. They're um, not going to, I'm not going to. That's and right. I'm going to take do. my ball and go home. <laughs> you know, we do, we get in, we right. get into those moments where it's just like, you do, you get angry and you're like, mm-hmm. and then, then you can become introverted and recluse and be like, I don't want to deal with anybody because I don't trust anybody and cognitive distortion, always, never, nobody, everybody kind of thing. Right. I, I so, love that you said that though. It was, it was around that time that I started to, through therapy and other things, started to come up with the concept of the attachment wounds mm-hmm. um, because I was really trying to understand what was going on with me why I was so angry. And so I started to figure out, well, these are attachment wounds. This is what's going on with me. And when I started to identify those, it put a lot of things into perspective. It helped me understand why I was so angry all the time, why I was so fearful all the time, why I was numbing the way that I was numbing. It started to like put the pieces together. And through that, I was able to realize healing can happen my my wounds can heal and i don't have to continue to believe those false narratives anymore so it's really interesting about 10 years after that i had done a lot of work um 
I, the bitterness was gone. I was feeling okay. And a friend of mine ended up having a stroke. And my old ecclesiastical leader um, was pretty good, was close to him and me. And so I texted him just out of courtesy and said, hey, I want you to know so-and-so's in the hospital. He's probably not going to make it. So if you want to uh, say goodbye, you probably should come. And so the ecclesiastical leader, and I hadn't really talked for a long time, I, I, but he reached out and said, well, do you want to go with me? And my initial thought was, no, I do not want to go with you. You ruined my life, you bugger. <laughs> and, but I'm like, well, okay, I'll go. So I, I go with them. People pleasing has, much? <laughs> right. He has no idea that any of this has been going on because I never told him. And so I'm sitting in there in the hospital room with him and the other man. And then the other ecclesiastical leader comes in the room. And <laughs> I'm like, you have got to be kidding me right now. And I expected to feel this wave of anger and resentment and just angst. And instead, I felt this light just wash through me. And I realized, wow. I do not have any animosity towards these two men anymore. They are wounded just like me. They made mistakes like I make mistakes. They um, maybe would have done it differently if they had a chance to do it again. But I looked at them and realized there I just had love, love for them, love for me. And I was like, whoa, this is what this feels like. This peace inside, this is amazing. And I just said a prayer to my higher power and said, thank you for healing that part of me. It doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, I, I know, I know that feeling where I remember the first time I saw my ex-husband that I had so much anger toward and I felt nothing and just feeling nothing I was grateful for. And then advancing from that, like you said, when you, when you finally are at that place of like, okay, I'm good. I have gratitude because I've healed this peace. I've healed this. I don't have to give any more energy to this. And now I see you with more compassion and understanding. And I hate to say this, but I like indifference. I like it when, when I've got to a point of being indifferent to mm -hmm. you just do you and I'll do me instead of being so focused. And I think we all do this. We stay so focused on the person we're angry at, we want them to be miserable because they made us miserable. So indifference is not always a bad thing. And I found a wonderful word of the day the other day for indifference and it's poco curante. Is that the most fabulous word? And it means indifference. So wow. I've been using that a lot with my grandson. Don't be poco curante with me <laughs> when he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to talk to me. So yeah, word of the day vocabulary is my passion. Well, this I love is, that. This Me and my mentor, great. we used to do word of the day and uh, and we would, our goal was to figure out a way to use the word of the day in our group session with our clients. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's fun. It's fun because some of these words and I'm like the vocabulary gal. I like, I love vocabulary. I just think it's, my dogs are going crazy. They were wrestling. Oh, okay. My goodness. I got a fat little chihuahua here who needs to <laughs> let some of her yayas out. But um, yeah, I love vocabulary. And it's just how many, there's so many words out there. There's endless abundance of words that we don't use. And so um, we need to really explore using different words. But I want to thank you so much. This has been fun. And because we always talk about something pretty heavy, we always talk about heavier subjects on I Never Knew to end it with something a little lighter called take my money all right yes so what that is is i would like to know what is the weirdest thing you've purchased or the weirdest thing you've seen for sale and i'm going to give you an example while you think about it before we got on i looked it up and i saw this is my favorite website it's called this is why i'm broke.com is that just like whoever invented that, that, <laughs> that domain just needs an award for best domain name. So this is why I'm broke.com. There is a 1 million piece puzzle. Oh, I know. Wow. It's only $4 and 99 cents. So it might be oh, worth the risk. If, 
if you want to challenge yourself, you know, start with the corners. But um, <laughs> I, with my ADHD, I don't, I don't think I no. do well with that. I think I would struggle <laughs> greatly. I'd have to use my focus, focus, focus mantra pretty, pretty often. The other one, and I have no idea what this involves. Maybe you do. Um, there is a radioactive uranium ore for sale. For oh, sale for that 40... sounds really healthy. <laughs> to buy that, carry that in your pocket. <laughs> so go to the airport with it. Oh my Forty nine ninety five. Now, oh wow, is that legal? I mean, do people just that... have radioactive uranium ore hanging out? I... Oh yeah, that's good. I don't just know. Cause cancer, get a big old uh, radiation yeah. wound on your leg. <laughs> Last time I checked, my stash of radioactive uranium ore was, you know, not in surplus mm. here at my no, house. I don't so, have any of that. what you got for me? What you got for me? Top that. <laughs> okay, well, so uh, my dad and I did not get along well. Uh, there was he was pretty abusive, to be honest. So. There was a huge time in my life where I did not want to be like him at all. So that's important for the story because we had just moved to Yuma and they had this home and garden show here. And so me, I went to the home and garden show and they had this display where there was this cooking demonstration and they were selling these pans. And I thought, oh, these are like the most amazing pans. They will last forever. They're only $2,000. Fine, here, take my money. And I bought them. And then immediately had buyer's remorse. They still are good. I've had them for 25 years and they're still pretty good. But I was like, what in the world did I do? Six months later, my dad comes down to visit and he said, I got to tell you, I went to this home and garden show and I was sitting at this uh, cooking show and they had these pans and I just had to buy them. And I said, no, no way. <laughs> so we both bought <laughs> $2,000 worth of pants. <laughs> I'm just going to say this and you're going to kill me. Nature versus nurture. All right, right. <laughs> Sometimes there are just genetic things we cannot get away from. Oh my goodness. What a great story. Did you tell him you bought the pants? I did. You... I did. Oh. I said, oh, yep. I know exactly what pans you're talking about. I got some in the kitchen. <laughs> the fact that they lasted that long, I'm impressed. I mean, they're pretty good. Pretty good. Yes, I, I'm all about the pans. I, I gourmet mm. cook and to find a good pan is, you know, very um, difficult. You know, I mean, I mm. and you do. You have to spend a lot that in knives. You know, yes, like knives. Uh, Gordon Ramsay has like a pan mm -hmm. set and then the knives like do not get cheap knives because you're going to go through a no. hundred of them. And my husband right. love my lovely, lovely husband sharpens my knife after every oh. single meal because he cleans. I cook and he cleans um, the kitchen. So he's sharpening that thing. You get oh. some brownie points for that. I know he's fantabulous. So, well, you are just precious to me Thank and you. <laughs> of course your last name is love because we just love you and Thank i you. just you were meant to be a love because you are a little love but you want to hear one more weird thing yes of course i, I was do. also born on valentine's day oh <gasps> no you were not i really was that is so interesting <laughs> that is, your last name is love and you're born on valentine's like Hello, you're just the sweetest, like, love, 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 which no pressure. Is... I have to be a loving person. <laughs> oh my God. I know. Right. What if you were a jerk? I mean, right? sorry. You're like, <laughs> dang, now I really can't be a jerk. I can't really say right. what I want. No, uh, everybody in my world is actually um, an Aquarian around that time. Um, mm. Yeah, I've got both daughters born the 8th and the 10th of February. And my husband was born February 16th. All so, right. Two days after you, my daughter-in-law, February 17th. So it's just like this. Now you fit it's right a in. It's month the, of birthdays. You fit right in, right in that little, that little grouping. I didn't have a uh, Valentine's person yet. Oh, so well, you could adopt me. I know. Fantastic. I'm going to. I think I'm going to. I'm going to put you oh. in my pocket and just oh, thank you. you. Guess, you know, then you won't have any abandonment issues. That's so right. Now you belong to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. 
I loved this conversation. I had so much fun. I don't know about you, but I just think we're going to have to do this again. And we're going to have to stay connected because I would um, love that. Yeah, I just feel totally in sync with you. And you're just such a joy. And I think everybody, listeners, I hope you got as much out of Troy Love as I did. And he's just full of information. Where can they find you if if there's anything you want to promote? Now's your chance. Sure. Uh, So you can go to findingpeaceconsulting.com. And if you go there, you'll see that uh, there's a free invitation to take the five-day Finding Peace Challenge, which is free. And every day for five days, you'll get a little video from me that explains the model, kind of what we've been talking about today on the podcast and, and help you find a, a little bit more peace, joy, and love and, and happiness in your life. Yeah. What, who could say no to that? So finding peace consulting.com guys go on there and, and take that, that assessment quiz and uh, yeah, reach out if you guys want um, some help from Troy as well, because he's got a lot of good information to help you with those attachment wounds and all of that good stuff that I learned a lot about today as well. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and of course, guys, you know where to find me dating, relationship coaching, uh, self worth, self esteem coaching, and life coaching and business coaching, lifecoachmaureen.com.com. And what else do I have going on? Oh, I do the same spiel every day. Uh, books, books, Amazon. My dog is more enlightened than I am. My dog is my relationship coach. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Outskirts Press. Book number three is coming. And of course, our doggy boutique. Nothing but healthy, holistic, organic, fun gifts for your furry babies at mydogiseverything.net. And if you're in the Austin area, we are doing markets. We're doing fun, fun markets. Um, The next one we're going to do is a farmer's market and it's all dog products. How cool is that? That's this Sunday and it will be in Austin on Spring Street. So if you're around the area, guys, um, please, please come see me. Um, Other than that, You guys just take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And most of all, please take care of those furry babies. Please adopt. Please, please adopt dogs. Do not shop. Love you all. Any comments, anyone that wants to be a guest or anyone that just um, wants to give a lovely review for us, we would appreciate it. And until next week, talk to you later.